What if you had a dream? A dream that challenged everything you knew about cars. A dream that inspired you to create something that no one had ever seen before. A dream that drove you to pursue the impossible. The perfect car. A car that had only one purpose, one ultimate aim. To go beyond the limits of what is possible, to set a new standard for speed. To push the boundaries of performance with the best technology available, no matter the challenge. This was the dream of one man in 1988. He had the courage to ask the question that would change his life and the car industry forever. What if a car was created without rules, without limits? He gave everything he had to find the answer. A masterpiece of engineering and design crafted from carbon fiber, gold, and Iconel. A singular pursuit of speed, of driving that would redefine fast forever. He was a brilliant engineer with a vision, a passion, and a mission. He faced fierce competition from the giants of the car world, Ferrari, Porsche, and Lamborghini. They all wanted to know the answer to his question. What if a car was created without rules, without limits? He showed them the answer. The world's first hypercar, the McLaren F1. This is his story. The story of how one man, Gordon Murray, created the perfect car. A car that was built with Formula One technology, but not for racing. A car that was built for the road, but not for comfort. A car that was built for speed, but not for records. A car that was built for driving. It all started in 1988, a year of change and innovation in the world. The Soviet Union began to collapse under Mikhail Gorbachev's reforms. The first transatlantic fiber optic cable was laid between France and North America. The first internet virus infected thousands of computers. The first stealth bomber flew over Nevada. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched into orbit. And in the world of cars, there were new challengers and new champions. Ferrari unveiled their F40 a twin turbocharged monster that claimed to be the fastest production car ever made, with a top speed of 201 miles per hour. Porsche released their 959, a technological marvel that featured all-wheel drive, adjustable suspension, and twin sequential turbochargers, reaching 197 miles per hour. Lamborghini introduced their Diablo, a successor to the iconic Countach, with a V12 engine that produced 485 horsepower and hit 202 miles per hour. Bugatti revived their brand with the EB110, a quad turbocharged beast that boasted 560 horsepower and reached 213 miles per hour. These were the supercars of 1988, the kings of speed and power. They were fast, they were furious, they were expensive, but they were not perfect. They had flaws, they had compromises, they had limitations. They were not enough for Gordon Murray. Gordon Murray was working as a designer for McLaren's Formula One team in 1988. He had already made a name for himself in the racing world, designing innovative and controversial cars like the Brabham BT46B fan car, which used a giant fan to suck air from under the car and create massive downforce. He had also helped McLaren win championships with cars powered by Honda engines. And he had fallen in love with the Honda NSX, a mid-engine sports car that was reliable, practical, and fun to drive. He wanted to make a car like that, but better. He wanted to make the ultimate road car. He had a vision of what it would look like, what it would feel like, and what it would do. He wrote down his manifesto on a sheet of paper, sketching out his ideas and specifications. He wanted a lightweight and rigid carbon fiber chassis, a naturally aspirated V12 engine with at least 550 horsepower, a central driving position with two passenger seats on either side, active aerodynamics, and no electronic assists. He wanted a car that would weigh less than 1,000 kilograms, have a maximum width of 1.8 meters, and have minimal front and rear overhangs. He wanted a car that would be stable at high speeds, drivable at low speeds, and comfortable on any road. He presented his manifesto to his bosses at McLaren, Ron Dennis, the team manager, Creighton Brown, the director of racing, and Mansour Oje, the financial backer. They were impressed by his vision and agreed to support him in creating a new company called McLaren Cars. They gave him a budget of 50 million pounds and a deadline of three years. They also gave him complete freedom to assemble his dream team of engineers and designers. Gordon Murray 
gathered some of the best minds in the industry, including Peter Stevens, who designed the Lotus LNM 100, Steve Randall, who pioneered computer modeling for car chassis, and Paul Roche, who designed BMW engines for Formula One cars. Together, they worked tirelessly to turn Murray's vision into reality. They built thousands of models and tested them in wind tunnels. They sourced exotic materials like titanium, gold, and iconel. They negotiated with suppliers and partners to get the best components and services. The biggest challenge they faced was finding the right engine for the F1. Murray wanted a V12 engine that could produce 100 horsepower per liter, rev beyond 7,500 RPM, weigh less than 250 kilograms, run reliably under extreme conditions, and act as a structural part of the car. He approached several manufacturers like Honda, Ferrari, and Isuzu, but none of them could meet his demands or expectations. He finally found his partner in BMW, who agreed to design an all-new engine called the S70-2. It was an aluminum-forged masterpiece with 6.1 liters of displacement and 627 horsepower output. It had dry sump lubrication, variable valve timing, vanos, individual ignition coils, and water pumps for each cylinder bank. It exceeded Murray's requirements in every way except one. It weighed 20 kilograms more than he wanted. But Murray had to compromise on this one detail because everything else about the F1 was perfect. The engine fits snugly behind the rear seats wrapped in gold foil to keep it cool. The exhaust pipes were made of Iconel, a lightweight aerospace metal that could withstand high temperatures and also serve as the rear crumple zone. The transmission had no flywheel because Murray argued that it was unnecessary for such a balanced engine with a light clutch. The suspension was tuned to provide optimal handling and feedback without compromising comfort or stability. The brakes were intelligent and active, cooling themselves when needed without affecting aerodynamics. The F1 was a masterpiece of engineering and design, a car that was as beautiful as it was functional. Its unique doors opened in a striking upward and outward manner. Inside, the car boasted a roomy and lavish interior adorned with leather, carbon fiber, and Alcantara. A specially crafted Kenwood sound system with 10 speakers and a CD changer provided exceptional audio quality. The F1 also came with custom-made luggage perfectly fitting in the front compartment. In addition, each F1 included a gold-plated titanium toolkit, offering everything a driver could desire. The F1 was ready for production in 1992 after three years of development. Only 64 road cars were made, each one hand-built by skilled craftsmen in a spotless factory. Each one cost over half a million pounds, making it the most expensive car in the world at the time. Each one was unique and personalized to the owner's preferences and specifications. Each one was a work of art and a testament to Murray's vision. The F1 was also ready for performance, even though it was never intended to be a fast car. Murray didn't care about top speed or lap times or zero to 60 times. He only cared about making the best car possible. But the F1 was so good that it broke records anyway without even trying. It accelerated faster than any other car in the world reaching 60 miles per hour in 3.2 seconds, 100 miles per hour in 6.3 seconds, and 200 miles per hour in 28 seconds. It had more torque at 1500 RPM than most cars had at Redline. It handled better than any other car in the world with precise steering, responsive throttle, and balanced weight distribution. It was stable and smooth at any speed, even at its top speed of 240.1 miles per hour, which it achieved in 1998 at Volkswagen's test track in Germany. It became the fastest naturally aspirated production car ever made, a record that still stands today. Murray didn't want to compromise his road car for the sake of competition. He only agreed to make nine race-ready versions of the F1, called the GTR, after overwhelming demand from customers and enthusiasts. He didn't have to do much to make them race-worthy. He added a roll cage, upgraded the brakes, tightened the steering, detuned the engine, and added some extra downforce. He didn't even bother to change the tires or the gearbox. The F1 GTR debuted in 1995 at Le Mans, the most prestigious endurance race in the world. It faced fierce competition from purpose-built race cars from Ferrari, Porsche, Jaguar, Bugatti, and others. 
but it proved to be unbeatable. It won the race outright, beating cars that were faster and more powerful on paper. It also set the speed record on the Mulsanne Straight at 174.6 miles per hour. It was BMW's first win, Honda's first win, and McLaren's first win at Le Mans. It also took four of the top five spots in the race. The F1 GTR continued to dominate the racing scene for years, winning championships and trophies all over the world. It was one of the most successful and consistent race cars ever made, and people still race them professionally today. The McLaren F1 was more than just a car. It was a legend, a phenomenon, a masterpiece. It was the ultimate road car, the ultimate driver's car, the ultimate hypercar. It was Gordon Murray's dream come true. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new about the McLaren F1 and its amazing story. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. And don't forget to hit the bell icon to get notified when we upload new content. Thank you for watching and see you next time.